Now, I first remember Eve Engler coming to Kelowna the first time he had these wonderful little red stickers that said, Canada out of Haiti, that we uh, plastered all over. And he was, uh, he impressed me uh, with his knowledge about Haiti. He's an independent researcher. He goes out and he, he, does, uh, he does the research and he's come up with these, these books. From Canada and Haiti, he went to a broader view of Canadian foreign policy in this, black books. He's got Stop Signs, which is about cars and capitalism. And his first book was, was about his early days and how he became a, a, first a student radical and then you know, sort of transitioned into being a full-time radical and writer. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, building apartheid is, is focusing on the Canada and Israel connection. It's a very good little study there, too. So <clears throat> I think Eve Engler is more like the Canadian Chomsky, although, as I say, he's, he's actually better than Chomsky because <laughs> he's, he's sort of a garage Chomsky. He, he goes right, to the, uh, right to, the, to the sources, and he, uh, he, he tells a story that's uh, unfortunately not told in the uh, high school uh, textbooks. I wish the, the uh, room could be full of high school students. But I have a lot to learn about Canadian history myself. I'm interested to hear about Lester Pearson. So tonight we're going to hear about Lester's peacekeeping. Thanks for thank everyone coming out. Um, this is uh, part of the tour for this my latest book, uh, Lester Pearson's Peacekeeping, The Truth May Hurt. Uh, and for those who aren't aware, Pearson was uh, entered ex external affairs in 1928. He was uh, a, a diplomat or a bureaucrat for a couple decades there. He then became Canada's ambassador in uh, Washington, about a year and a half, then became the head of the lead bureaucrat of external affairs for uh, two years, and then was external minister from 1948 to 1957, and then prime minister from 63 to 68. So he's the most important post-World War II uh, foreign policy decision maker. But he has been dead since uh, 1972 for 40 years, for longer than I've been alive. Maybe not than most people in this room, but then uh, so you know, what's the point of writing a book about somebody who's been dead um, for, that, for that long? And the first, my first motivation for writing the book was coming across progressive-minded people who will cite Lester Pearson's name uh, as the symbol of Canadian foreign policy they want to strive towards. And in the introduction of the book, <clears throat> I cite people like uh, Jack Layton, Elizabeth May, uh, Stephen Staples from the Rideau Institute, Linda McQuaig, uh, even Naomi Klein as progressive individuals who cited Pearson as a, as a sort of symbol of the foreign policy that they, uh, that they believe in. So knowing that that wasn't based in fact, uh, that's part of the motivation for writing a book, is countering uh, that idea. Another motivation for writing a book is there was actually a straight line between Lester Pearson's foreign policy and our good friend Stephen Harper's foreign policy today. Uh, and that's the bulk of this talk, which is the parallels between Pearson and, uh, uh, Les, uh, and Stephen Harper. And Stephen Harper's aggressive, militaristic uh, foreign policy. But before getting to the parallels, uh, just a little bit in response to those who cite Pearson as this benevolent international actor. Uh, which, is he, which is what the, he's, he is the symbol of. Uh, Pearson had Canada deliver weapons to the French while they put down the independent struggles in Vietnam, in Algeria. When there were 400,000 French troops in Algeria, and the lead bureaucrat at External Affairs was a bit wary of Canada's position in support of the French, Pearson pushed to continue Canadian support for the French, and continued weapons uh, deliveries uh, uh, to the French. Pearson incited individuals to destroy a peace group that called for the abolition of nuclear weapons, the Peace Congress, when University of Toronto 
engineering students took over a Peace Congress chapter uh, with the intent of undermining the organization, Pearson publicly lauded them, Went to, had a community meeting in Toronto, publicly lauded these engineering students for their high-minded zeal, and called on other Canadians across the country to uh, do likewise in terms of trying to destroy uh, the Peace Congress. Pearson backed the two most infamous early CIA coups in uh, Iran against Mossadegh in 53, in Guatemala against Arbenz in 54. In the case of Iran, he criticized Iran's nationalization of its oil in 51. Uh, they nationalized the Anglo-Iranian company, which was the predecessor to British Petroleum, which had been profiting off of Iranian oil for decades, which was much, much reviled among Iranians. Uh, Pearson criticized the nationalization of, of, of Iranian oil. He, uh, or Canada, supported the British-led blockade of Iranian oil uh, after uh, the nationalization. And Canada began its diplomatic relations with Iran uh, in 1955, uh, after Mossadegh was overthrown and the Shah was uh, put into place. So not, not, a, not, a, not a level of complicity like the 2004 coup in Haiti, uh, but nevertheless a certain degree of Canadian complicity in uh, the coup against uh, Mossadegh uh, as well as uh, uh, Arbenz, which I won't get into detail about. 1964, NDP MP called, for, called on Pearson to call for Nelson Mandela's release from prison. Pearson refused to call for Mandela's re release from prison, who had just been imprisoned by the apartheid regime. And that was reflective of his ambivalence towards apartheid South Africa. Uh, while external minister, South Africa's uh, ambassador to the UN called Pearson and Paul Martin Sr., who was Canada's ambassador to the UN, quote, good friends of South Africa. During his time as Prime Minister, after South Africa was pushed out of the Commonwealth, uh, and the NDP was pushing for uh, Canada to break off its special Commonwealth uh, trade uh, tariffs with South Africa, because it, the country was no longer part of the Commonwealth, Pearson refused to break off those special uh, uh, trade uh, agreement with, with South Africa. So there was a certain degree of ambivalence towards uh, apartheid uh, South Africa. In her book, Holding the Bully's Coat, Linda McQuaig, everyone, everyone familiar with Linda McQuaig? No? Mm -hmm. Linda McQuaig, is a, she's a columnist for the Toronto Star. She's probably the second most left-wing columnist in mainstream Canadian media. Uh, she's somebody who actually writes quite uh, elegantly about inequality in, this, in our society and about economic inequality, uh, about corporate power. Uh, so generally, a, you know, pretty, pretty uh, sensible uh, you know, uh, author. In her book, Holding the Bully's Coat, she refers to Pearson's, quote, distaste for colonialism. The historic record is much more complicated than that. So during Pearson's time as external minister, Canada's relations with British Africa were uh, obviously overseen by London. And when Canadians started pushing, started pushing, started criticizing British colonialism in Africa, and there was increasing demands for independence across Africa, this is what Pearson said to the House of Commons in January of 1957. Quote, no people in the world have proved themselves more, de more dependable defenders of freedom than have the British. I think there's a few people around the world that might, uh, might question that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, those countries which still have direct responsibilities for non-self-governing territories, non-self-governing territory of course is a colony, should not be made to feel at the United Nations or elsewhere that they are oppressors to be deprived arbitrarily of their rights or indeed their reputations. Uh, that's Pearson's response to those criticizing British colonialism uh, in Africa. Probably the worst thing that Pearson was involved with, certainly as external minister, maybe in his old time uh, in office, was the Korean War of 1950 to 1953. Uh, about three million people were killed in the Korean War. It was fought 
uh, under a UN banner, but it was a US-led mission. So General, uh, US General MacArthur, who headed it up, head up the, the war for the first part, at least, uh, he was not subject to UN command structures, just US command structure, structures, even though he headed up the UN mission. So it was a US-led US mission under a UN banner. And uh, Canada immediately sent uh, three naval vessels to Korea after the Americans invaded. But Prime Minister Senehan and Defence Minister Claxton were wary about sending Canadian ground troops. Pearson pushed hard within cabinet to send ground troops to the point where in an August 1950 letter to, to Prime Minister Senehan, he actually insinuated that he would resign as external minister if Canada did not send ground troops uh, uh, to Korea. Ultimately, Canada does send ground troops, of course, 27,000 Canadian ground troops. And to understand the horror of the Korean War, it's, it's kind of it's pretty incomprehensible, or at least to me, I think to, 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 to many people, it would be almost incomprehensible. At one point, Americans stopped bombing North Korea because all buildings, because all buildings of more than two stories were destroyed. And uh, this New York Times article from February 1951 describes uh, a hamlet of about 200 people that was wiped out by American bombing. Uh, it gives a sense of the horror of the war. This is the New York Times. Quote, a napalm raid hit the village three or four days ago when the Chinese were holding up the advance. And nowhere in the village have they buried the dead because there is nobody left to do so. This correspondent came across one old woman, the only one who seemed to be left alive, dazedly hanging up some clothes in a blackened courtyard filled with the bodies of four members of her family. The inhabitants throughout the village and in the fields were caught and killed and kept the exact postures they had held, they had held when the napalm struck. A man about to get on his bicycle, 50 boys and girls playing in an orphanage, a housewife, strangely unmarked, holding in her hand a page torn from a Sears Roebuck catalog. That's a pretty horrific description of just the brutality of the war. Pearson's response to this article appearing in the New York Times was to send a memo from Canada's ambassador to Canada's ambassador in Washington asking him why the U.S. media censors, in place during the war, had allowed that article to appear in the newspaper. He was concerned, um, not with what most people in this room were concerned about, I think, which is the, the human toll of that report, but what effect this might have on Asian opinion about the war and our ability to continue fighting the war. Right? He was concerned more with imperial interests rather than the human interests, uh, the human toll of what was happening in Korea. So the rest of the talk will be focusing on the parallels between uh, Stephen Harper's foreign policy and Lester Pearson's. In his biography, Pearson refers to the formation of NATO as, quote, the most important thing I participated in. Right, so most Canadians, if you ask them about Lester Pearson, uh, what he symbolizes, they would say peacekeeping. Probably, for those who, who had any response, 95% would probably say peacekeeping. But Pearson himself cited NATO. Uh, and it makes complete sense why he would cite NATO and not peacekeeping when you understand what the motivation was in establishing the peacekeeping mission in Egypt in 1956, which he won a Nobel Peace Prize for. The point of the peacekeeping mission in Egypt was to protect NATO from internal division, or to minimize internal division within NATO. So the British, the French, the Israelis <coughs> invaded Egypt after Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Uh, Washington opposed that invasion. Washington opposed that invasion because it wanted to tell the former colonial powers, the British and the French, that there was a new boss in the region, the US, and it was also, Washington was also concerned that 
if they hadn't come out strong against the invasion, it would add to Moscow's prestige among the growing anti-monarchist movement in the Arab world. So Washington opposed the invasion, and the point of the peacekeeping mission that Pearson helped establish uh, was to aid the U.S. in bringing primarily Britain back into realignment with U.S. policy in the Middle East. Right? It was designed to help the British save face from a disastrous invasion that the U.S. opposed. And it, was, it wasn't about Egyptian civilians, it wasn't, it wasn't about Egyptian sovereignty, it was about minimizing that division within NATO, primarily between the U.S. and Britain, but as well as, as, well as uh, 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 France. So it was about advancing uh, U.S. geopolitical uh, objectives in the region. Hence, it makes complete sense that Pearson himself would cite NATO as the most important thing he participated in, and not peacekeeping, when for him, the point of the peacekeeping mission was to protect uh, uh, NATO. So, what was the point? Uh, back to the question of NATO and getting to the parallels. <laughs> there are two main reasons for the creation of NATO. And some say that NATO was actually a Canadian idea, going back to 46. First speech by a cabinet minister for a NATO-type organization was by saint Laurent, who was then external minister. The speech was largely written by Pearson, who was then the head lead bureaucrat of external affairs. And Pearson would uh, represent Canada at secret NATO uh, organizing meetings in 1948 alongside the British and Americans. And of course, NATO was ultimately established in 1949. So what was the point of NATO? Well, the story we're told was that it was a defensive arrangement in the face of possible Soviet, Russian Soviet invasion of Western Europe, North America, uh, wherever. Now that today is totally laughable in, in the fact that the Cold War has ended, the Berlin Wall has fallen, NATO continues. So it obviously wasn't about that. Uh, and it was even laughable at the time because the Russians had lost something like 25 million people during World War II they were much weakened, much much weaker after World War II, vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. The uh, U.S. had just lost very few people during World War II, had something like 40% of the world's GDP at the end of World War II. They were cl clearly far and away in the position of, of power uh, in the world. So what was the real point of the creation of NATO? Well, there's two points. One that has little to do with today, one that has a lot to do with today. The one that has little to do with today was that during World War II, uh, the communist parties in Western Europe had gained a lot of prestige because it was usually them that had led the fight against Mussolini in Italy, that had led the fight against the Nazis in France. And after World War II, there was a real sense that communism was the wave of the future in Western Europe. And this wasn't a communism directed from Moscow, but this was indigenous to these countries. And in the case of Italy, the communist parties probably would have won the first post-World War, World War II election, except for American intervention. And in the case of France, they won something like 30% of the vote, despite American uh, uh, interventions. So the point of NATO was to strengthen the Western European elite's confidence in the face of growing socialist communist movements. And Pearson was relatively explicit about this on a handful of occasions. So in March 1949, he said in the House of Commons, quote, The power of the communists, wherever that power flourishes, depends upon their ability to suppress and destroy the free institutions that stand against them. They pick them off one by one. The political parties, the trade unions, the churches, the schools, the universities, the trade associations, even the sporting clubs, and the kindergartens. Kindergartens. How about nurseries? <laughs> Not the nurseries. They leave those down. That's below. That's beneath them. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is meant to be a declaration to the world that this kind of conquest from within, conquest from within, will not in the future take place amongst us. That's a pretty explicit statement about the intent of NATO 
to provide the Western European elite uh, with, the, with North American backing, British North American backing, in the context of growing left-wing movements within those countries. So that was one uh, part of what the creation of NATO was about. The other part of what NATO was about was world domination. Uh, and Pearson was relatively explicit about this too. He said in, in 51 in the House of Commons that, quote, the Middle East is strategically far too important to the defense of the North Atlantic area to allow it to become a power vacuum or to pass into unfriendly hands. In 53, he said, quote, there is now only a relatively small geographical gap between Southeast Asia and the area covered by the North Atlantic Treaty, which goes to the eastern boundaries of Turkey. That small geographical gap, something like 5,000 kilometers, right? But the point was is that any, if any area went, moved outside of Western influence, it became a threat to the North Atlantic area. Hence, it was justified to you know, put down that threat, to, to suppress uh, uh, that threat. And so, uh, to the extent that NATO was a, was a defensive arrangement, it was a defensive arrangement in the, con in, the, uh, in the context of, during World War II, the former colonial powers had been weakened, primarily Britain and France. They had been weakened, and they were to maintain some semblance of their previous position, they were increasingly dependent upon North American support and internal unity among those leading colonial capitalist powers. Um, and so, so NATO, uh, so Canada um, uh, supported, as I alluded to earlier, Canada supported, uh, through NATO, supported the, the French as they put down the independence movements in Algeria and, and uh, Vietnam. And that was Canadian aid, about $60 million in Canadian aid, in neutral, uh, NATO mutual aid, weapons. Those weren't, we weren't selling weapons to the French, we were donating wep weapons to the French through NATO's mutual aid program as they suppressed those uh, anti-colonial uh, movements. And this is what Pearson's, this is how Pearson described it in the House of Commons in 53. He said, quote, the assistance we have given to France as a member of the NATO, NATO Association may have helped her recently in the discharge of some of her obligations in Indochina. Those obligations, I believe that's, that's a euphemism for brutally suppressing an independence movement. Um, so the point again, the point of NATO was to maintain some semblance of the former colonial uh, uh, authority in the world, but with that increasingly passing into the hands of the emerging North American hegemon. Right? And so when we talk about a thousand Canadian military trainers in Central, Air, Central Asia, we call them trainers now, a um, thousand trainers in Afghanistan, the NATO mission there, or we talk about Canada's role in the bombing, NATO bombing of Libya, Right, you can find the roots of those policies very clearly back to what Pearson was thinking about when he helped in establishing uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So there's a, there's a strong parallel uh, uh, there. Another parallel that's pretty close, or there's a strong uh, uh, a parallel between Pearson's position on Zionism, Palestine, Israel, and Stephen Harper's over-the-top pro-Israel, uh, boasting that Canada is the best friend of Israel in the world, despite Israel's ongoing uh, dispossession of Palestinians, despite Israel's continued belligerence in the region, and. Uh, In 1947, when the British handed their mandate of Palestine uh, to the UN, Pearson played an a important role in two different UN, me uh, UN meetings dealing with the question of Palestine. Uh, 
uh, and he was very sympath sympathetic towards the Zionist movement. So on the first committee that he actually chaired at the UN, this is the committee that created the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, which was the international body that was went to the region to investigate the matter and to come up with a plan for the British mandate. He defined the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine very broadly in a way that was seen as very sympathetic to the Zionist cause. Uh, so for instance, he wanted to include the question of post-World War II Jewish refugees that had been uh, displaced by the Nazis. Uh, he wanted to include that in the question of Palestine as if what the Nazis had done in Europe was somehow related to what you know, to Palestinians. And this is particularly uh, dubious because at the same time, or just previously to s sitting in this position, Pearson had uh, upheld the Mackenzie King government's anti-Semitic policy on Jewish refugees, right? They didn't want Jewish refugees, they weren't allowing Jewish refugees into Canada after World War II, and Pearson had upheld that in his position while he was ambassador in, in the U.S., uh, but so it, he wanted to make that, tie that into the question of Palestine, which obviously the Zionist movement uh, was sympathetic towards. And the second uh, committee, uh, which Pearson played an important role of at the UN, uh, he pushed the partition plan, the majority report, the partition plan, that gave the Zionist movement 55% of historic Palestine, even though the Jewish community was less than a third of the population, even though it owned less than 7% of the land, that was a partition plan that was bitterly resisted by the indigenous Palestinian population. And <clears throat> it was actually dubbed the Canadian plan by the New York Times uh, because, the, because of the role Pearson had played in terms of negotiating the matter between uh, Washington and Moscow. And it's important to note, in pushing the partition plan, Pearson had basically no concern for what the indigenous Palestinian population had to say very little concern for what Canada's Jewish community had to say. He was concerned primarily with what Washington had to say, secondarily what Moscow and what London had to say uh, on the matter. <clears throat> and the partition plan that Pearson pushed ultimately helps provide the Zionist movement with a diplomatic cover for the Nakba, right? the destruction of Palestinian society where something like 85% of Palestinians are driven from their homes in late 47 and, uh, and 48. In 1952, after Nasser came to power in Egypt, Pearson told, Canada's, uh, Pearson told Israel's ambassador in Ottawa that Canada would look more favorably on Israeli arms requests because Nasser was seen as unreliable. In the lead-up to 1967 war, when Israel captures Egypt, Sinai, the Golan Heights from Syria, Gaza, and the West Bank. In the lead up to the 67 war, uh, Canada sponsors a resolution at the UN uh, condemning Egypt's uh, blockade of uh, Israeli shipping through the Straits of Tehran. And Canada did so at a time when the head of the UN was in Egypt negotiating the matter with Nasser. And Canada's sponsoring this resolution was seen as very much contributing to the drumbeats towards war, contributing to the diplomatic justification for the Israeli uh, 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 invasion. And the Egyptian newspaper Al Aram uh, described, uh, responded to Canada's position or Canada's resolution at the UN by calling Canada, quote, a stooge of Western powers who seek to colonize the Arab world with Israel's help. After Israel captured uh, the Sinai, Golan Heights, West Bank, and Gaza, Pearson said that an Israeli withdrawal, quote, should be accompanied by effective international guarantees of security of Israel. Right? Despite the fact that Israel had shown itself to be far and away the leading military power in the region, it was always a question of Israeli security, which is not too dissimilar from the Harper government today, where despite Israel clearly being the military power uh, uh, in the region, it's always a question of Israeli security. We hear very little of a question of Palestinian security, a question of uh, Lebanese, uh, Syrian uh, security. And to understand why Pearson was such a strong supporter of Israel, a, a 1952 memo he sent to cabinet 
helps explain, and this is after the British-backed monarchy was overthrown in, in Egypt. It said, quote, with the whole Arab world in a state of internal unrest and in the grip of mounting anti-Western hysteria, Israel is beginning to emerge as the only stable element in the whole Middle East area. It went on to explain, quote, Israel may assume an important role in Western defense as the southern pivot of current plans for the defense of the Eastern Mediterranean. In other words, Israel was a Western military outpost in the heart of the Middle East. Or as Pearson put it in his biography, he referred to Israel as, quote, an outpost, if you will, of the West in the Middle East. That's almost word for word the language that Jason Kenney uses in describing Harper government's over-the-top uh, support for Israel. So there are strong parallels between Pearson government's support for Israel and uh, the Harper government's support for Israel. Another parallel that has, it's maybe a little bit less direct, but nevertheless uh, important, can be maybe seen through the question of the Vietnam War. And in, in her book, a book, Holding the Bully's Coat, Linda McQuaig refers to, or claims, quote, one could argue that Pearson's urgings may have, in some small way, contributed to ending the U.S. war effort in Vietnam. Have some people heard about the, the infamous or the famous meeting between Lyndon Johnson and Pearson after a, a speech he made? You pissed on my rug? Does anything mm -hmm. anyone? Somebody? No, come on. Really? No one? Tell us. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll get to this. No, you, people have this testimony? No one has one? Oh. Not a very educated crowd here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, come on. Oh, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a second. Houston, who? You mean everybody in Toronto knows the story? <laughs> well, I, I pretty much about two thirds of the meetings I've had, s someone in the question period has actually brought the story up. So I figured I'd just prompt in the question one. period that will bring it up then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you. <laughs> have to remind me what it is. The question. Yeah. <coughs> so while Pearson is often described as, as having been anti-war uh, by by people like Linda McQuaig by dozens and dozens of authors. This is what Pearson said in the House of Commons. He said, quote, my government, quote, supports the purposes and objectives of United States policy in Vietnam. That's pretty explicit. Uh, in 67, he said, quote, I believe that the United States moved into Vietnam in the first place to help, to help South Vietnam at the invitation of the government of that country to defend itself against military action and subversive terrorism. And there are literally dozens of similar comments in Hansard, in the House of Commons, that Pearson made, where he makes it abundantly clear that he supports the U.S. war in Vietnam. Despite that fact, he is often portrayed by sensible people like, Naomi, uh, like, uh, like Linda McQuake as having been anti-war. Uh, and again, Hansard is not, not exactly uh, a difficult <coughs> to uh, find source probably sitting at the library here, since at pretty much every academic library across the country. Yet he's presented as anti-war. But it wasn't just rhetorical uh, uh, support for the war. During the war, Canada became the leading arms uh, exporter per capita, said of sending weapons to the US. Pearson, of course, knew what was going on. He played a very two-faced game on the matter. Uh, during the war, the US tested their chemical agents in New Brunswick. Uh, with the American military explicitly testing them there with the intent of using them for defoliation efforts in Vietnam. And they have Alberta too. In Alberta too? Okay. Yeah, in yeah. southern Alberta. Yeah. Eileen Robinson was there. Okay. Uh, Canadian aid went to supporting the South Vietnamese regime uh, during the war. Canada was on the International Control Commission with uh, Poland, India, uh, and Canada. Uh, an international control commission created in 1954 uh, after the Geneva Accords, or as part of the Geneva Accords, was designed to peacefully reunify North and South Vietnam. Pearson immediately, as external minister, uh, had Canadian international control commission officers spy on the North Vietnamese for the Americans. His only concern was that uh, the Americans didn't say publicly where they got the information, because that of course could embarrass uh, this country. 
uh, as a Canadian brigadier explained, quote, he regularly furnished the CIA with information about North Vietnamese troop movements. In the book, uh, Noam Chomsky has a, has a foreword to the book where he refers to Pearson as a war criminal. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, See, you are Noam. <laughs> and and, and he, he, uh, he describes a story of having gone on uh, uh, Peter Zosky's morning side mm -hmm. in the 1980s. People are probably familiar with Peter Zosky. We know that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he made it out this far west to yeah, yeah. get the CBC signal on him. <laughs> um, and so he, he describes the story of going on to Peter Zosky's show. He, he had previously he'd gone on to Zosky's show before, and, and uh, Chomsky had always criticized U.S. foreign policy. And Zosky was happy to hear criticism of U.S. foreign policy. So one time, <clears throat> he said, Trump would say, okay, I've had enough, I'm going to start taking aim at Canadian foreign policy. So Zosky asks him, um, so you know, you just arrived in Toronto? And Chomsky says, yeah, I just arrived at War Criminal Airport. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Lester B. Pearson Airport in Toronto. And Zosky completely loses it. <laughs> completely loses it. And just starts yelling at Chomsky on air. <laughs> to the point where hundreds of people call in to complain. And according to somebody at a recent meeting, the next day Zosky was forced to apologize on air for, for his treatment of, uh, of Chomsky. Yeah. And so when Chomsky refers to uh, Pearson as a war criminal, what he's referring to is the role that Pearson played in delivering... U.S. bombing threats to North Vietnam. So in May of 64, Lyndon Johnson and Pearson had a meeting, which was described in the Pentagon Papers, where Pearson okayed Canadian ICC commissioners delivering U.S. bombing threats to North Vietnam. So the Canadian ICC commissioner would go to Washington to be briefed about what to tell the North Vietnamese. Go to Hanoi and would say to the officials in Hanoi, if you don't do this, we, meaning the U.S., will bomb you. The U.S., of course, begins a full-scale bombing campaign in North Vietnam. Something like 100,000 people are killed. Clearly a war crime. And Pearson's complicity in that war crime is what Chomsky's referring to when calling Pearson uh, uh, a war criminal. So the question of Vietnam... Is not a, it's not really a direct parallel with, with today, but it's, it's the more general sense of the extent to which uh, Harper or Canadian Prime Minister in general is willing to go in advancing U.S. imperial aims despite the human consequence, right? And Pearson, kind of more broadly in terms of a parallel today, what Pearson should be understood rather than being seen as this benevolent international actor, diplomat, politician, what Pearson should symbolize in the history of Canadian foreign policy is the politician who did the most in terms of shifting Canada from a pro-British empire perspective to a pro-US empire perspective. And uh, Pearson understood earlier than many of his colleagues at External Affairs, or, or at least among the politicians, that Canada was well placed to benefit from the emerging post-World War II U.S. empire. <coughs> no other country's elite were better integrated with the, US, with the U.S. elite than the Canadian elite. Politically, culturally, and of course, <coughs> business-wise. The Abbott plan fit in there. Sorry? The Abbott plan fit in that era. I'm the, not, I'm not, I'm not oh, sure. Okay. An economic agreement between Canadian capital and American capital. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not even familiar, I'm not familiar with that, but fine. Should we describe it? Yeah. Describe it. Yeah. Um, so, Pearson understood this earlier. At the end of World War II, Canada was the second biggest creditor nation. Had the fourth or fifth biggest army in the world. All right, so Canada was well placed at the end of World War II. And, and was well placed to benefit from a U.S.-centered multilateral imperialism. And Pearson is the individual who did the most in terms of pushing that forward. Or as John Price explains in his 2011 book, Orient in Canada, a very good book, he explains, quote, What I am proposing is not just that the Canadian government played a supporting role in the emerging global order 
in which U.S. power would predominate, a position that others have argued before, but rather that it actively encouraged the United States to take on this role, and that it did so due to the values shared by the men in the foreign policy establishment of both countries. Values that reflected ideas about race and empire, reinforcing their belief that the Euro-American powers had to play a significant role in Asia as well as elsewhere. In an era of decolonization, the Canadian, gov the Canadian government aligned the country with American imperialism. Pearson was the individual doing the most to push that forward. And of course, uh, when we talk about uh, Stephen Harper's foreign policy today, you can't understand Stephen Harper's foreign policy today, Stephen Harper's aggressiveness, without understanding how he's operating in the context of U.S. empire and how he's actually pushing forward. He he's, seems sometimes ahead of Obama in pushing forward more aggressive, more imperialistic type policies. I think the question of Iran is one where we, we see that um, at play. So there's a parallel there, uh, an important sort of macro parallel there with, with Lester Pearson's uh, foreign policy on that front. And so moving towards a conclusion, uh, some people, when hearing this, uh, for instance, uh, a, a sort of family member of uh, Pearson's son came to talk in Hamilton, uh, was not very happy about the talk. Um, when, when, people, when people hear this, they think that, uh, that I think that you know, Pearson ate cats or you know, was this evil, really terrible guy like that. Um, yet everything I came across, he was a nice father, uh, just like uh, just like Stephen. He takes his son to you know hockey games in Calgary and stuff like that. Um, uh, Pearson was a nice, sociable guy by all by all indicators that I that I came across. Um, the issue was more structural. He was ambitious, and if you're going to be you want to be ambitious in and be in, in external affairs, you have to ingratiate yourself with powerful people, if you want to move up in that world, right? Uh, likewise, if you want to move up in the world of the political world, uh, you have to ingratiate yourself with powerful people, be there in Washington, be there among the Canadian business class. And Pearson was willing to uh, push forward uh, his own career uh, and the, the consequence of what he was participating in, uh, his own ambition overrode those, the human consequences. So I think the issue is really much more structural than just a question of bad Lester Pearson, uh, who had looked to the inequality in our society, who had looked to the history of colonialism, who had looked to Canadian investments abroad, who had looked to uh, you know, racism in this country, and on and on and on, that explained the context in which Pearson was, was operating. And so also, re re returning back to the progressive-minded thinkers, who cite Lester Pearson, right? Some people might say, uh, when Stephen Staples from the Rideau Institute or Linda McQuaig cite Pearson today, what they're, how they use him is as a way to restrain the most aggressive tendencies in the Harper government policy, right? They, they create this mythological character, and they say that you know, uh, Canada's history is we don't go to war without the UN. We're a peacekeeping nation. We're not a militaristic, aggressive nation. And Pearson is really the symbol of that. So, so he today is used as this way to restrain the worst elements of Harper's foreign policy. So some people might say, well, why criticize that myth? Okay, yeah, it's a myth, it's not true, but why criticize it when it's been used for a somewhat progressive purpose? Well, the first response to that, of course, is we should not be making foreign policy based upon lies. That's an obvious response. But more fundamentally than that, what you're doing by citing Pearson's foreign policy while trying to criticize Harper's foreign policy is you're implicitly downplaying the structural character of the problem, right? You're, you're implicitly downplaying the structural character. You're basically what you're saying is we got a bad crew in office, and if we just got a different crew in that position, things would all would all be better. They all be good. Well, they're even good. They're even implying. Well, my reading of the history of Canadian foreign policy is very far from that. My reading of the history of Canadian foreign policy is that it has always been fundamentally self-serving, fundamentally elite-driven, 
and Canada has been tied into the command and control of world empire for the past century. Right? And the world would do better with less Canada. But you can't say, you can't say that in the mainstream. If you want to call them, if you write that in your column in the Toronto Star, you can get that in there once maybe, maybe twice, and then if you keep doing that, that's it. You won't, you won't have your column in the Toronto Star anymore. So there's the constraints um, are, are that much uh, 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 greater. It, it, to, to say that is a real threat uh, is a, a, to, to even more of, of Canadian power. So for those uh, who might have come to the talk uh, still with this, uh, this sentiment of Lester Pearson as this uh, tying to their, their Canadian identity of this <coughs> peacekeeping history and this benevolent Canada, um, the truth may hurt, but it also sets you free. Thank you very much. <laughs>